Did you start recording? <laughs> no, All right. Our next speaker is a rock star. I was unable to find the positions of his uh, two successful hit singles from the from the in the earlier part of the previous century. Um, but I will say that I own his latest album, which came out in 2014? 2015. Uh, and it's entitled, That's All She Wrote After 57 Years. And uh, it's a really good album, and I encourage you to buy it. Um, Jim Shedlowski is going to be telling us about the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. He is a longtime member of the club, a former treasurer of the club, and rockabilly legend. He worked his 30, for 36 years as a vehicle development engineer at General Motors. He graduated from U of M in 1960 with a degree in engineering physics, spent two years as an officer in the U.S. Army in Germany, and uh, then came home and appeared on Dick Clark's bandstand in 1958. Uh, Jim's astronomical interests include observation and outreach, but in recent years, his passion for astronomical history and technology has become a major factor. He is a member of the McMath Holbert Astronomical Society, which runs and maintains the McMath Holbert Observatory up in Lake, Lake Angeles by Great Lakes Crossing. And he has also visited a number of major observatories. He is a major proponent of the Lost Discussion Group, so you will often find him there. He and his wife winter in Mesa, Arizona, and he participates in the activities of the East Valley Astronomy Club. And he has earned a certificate for observing 104 messy objects in one night. So, that all said, we're gonna see a lot more than 104 objects tonight. So, Jim, take it away. As soon as I find my cursor. Thank you all for coming tonight. And I'd like to say a special welcome to uh, one of my oldest friends, a fellow who I've been uh, best friends with for 68 years since uh, Mr. Johnson's physics class at Clarkson High School. <laughs> Harold Cameron, down here, uh, actually gave up a night of bowling and came from Huntsville, Texas, to be here tonight. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Harold, Harold and I, in the very early 50s, before, before Sputnik and all this stuff happened, we became enthusiasts for space travel back in the early, early 50s. Harold went on and did something about it, though. He volunteered for the first corps, first class of astronauts, was rejected on, because he was too tall, but went on to do the next danger, more dangerous thing and fly fighter pilots or fighter jets on, off of aircraft carriers in the Pacific back in the uh, late 50s, early 60s. So Harold and I had to go way back in space travel, and uh, I'd like to welcome him here tonight. But good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to my 13th annual September Cranbrook Storytelling Episode. This year's presentation would tell you the story of a project which is this decade's number one priority for the National Science Foundation in ground-based astronomy, and which may revolutionize our understanding of the solar system, our galaxy, and indeed, the entire universe. I will describe the unique instrument, the telescope and camera system, the facility and observatory housing it, the amazing program that it is tasked with, and the incredible data handling and management system which will furnish an astronomical data and information that has never been available before, and on a scale surpassing that of all previous attempts. Information that will be made available 
not only to the worldwide astronom astronomy community, but to you and I as citi and citizen scientists everywhere. Some of you may remember this slide from last September from my presentation entitled The Evolution of Giant Telescopes. In that presentation, I mentioned the LSST as one of four future giant telescopes currently under construction. The smallest future giant, but arguably the most important. So what is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope and why will it be so significant to our understanding of the universe. You might ask, as I did when I first started researching this presentation, what is a survey telescope and why is it important? The key word here is survey, or more specifically, what is an astronomical survey and what is its significance to the overall picture? Sky surveys have played an important role in astronomy since its earliest existence as a science. One of the first sky surveys was performed by Hipparchus in 129 BC and gave us one of our first catalogs containing rough locations of 890 stars. Over the year, technology has improved and so have surveys. By the 16th century, Tycho Brahe's surveys had plotted the positions of more than a thousand stars to within a small fraction of a degree, along with the planetary positions, which allowed Kepler's laws of planetary motion to be calculated. With the advent of the telescope, surveys became even more descriptive, precise, and valuable. William Herschel, for example, located and categorized thousands of deep sky nebula while producing the first NGC catalog still used today. And what amateur astronomer is not beholden to Charles Messier for his list of Messier objects? These early surveys became the basis for the organized practice of the science of astronomy. Then along came photography, and sky surveys took another leap forward, beginning in 1885 with Harvard's famous plate collection, which fused Edward Pickering's computers, the Lady Pickering, Computers to analyze the location and brightness of stars from the entire southern and northern hemisphere from photographic plates, which grew to an astounding number of 500,000 photographic plates. The efforts of such women as Henrietta Leavitt and Anna Jump Cannon in these surveys played key roles in Hubble's discovery of the universe back in the 1920s. Another notable milestone in photographic surveys came about in the 1950s with the Palomar Observatory Sky Survey's use of its 48-inch Schmidt Wide Field Telescope to catalog over 89 million celestial objects down to a magnitude of about 22 and was used for decades to catalog and categorize these objects. The final phase of sky surveying began in the 1990s when, much to the chagrin of Gary Ross, computing power came of age and continues to the present age. The digitalization of surveys. It first involved the digital scanning of earlier photographic surveys, and then direct digital imaging surveys, and finally the use of computational algorithms to analyze the increasing mass of data. This has given astronomy powerful new tools. Coupled with other modern technology, modern digital sky surveys have revolutionized the science of astronomy by enabling the correlation of data from many surveys across frequency domains, through time intervals, redshifts, and the like, on a statistically significant sample. <coughs> This has fostered and advanced the practice of virtual astronomy, whereby astronomers in the future will increasingly do their research by mining data from numerous widely available sky survey databases. And so now, we shall return to the LSST. I like that phrase in the, in the video, by the way. You should never let an engineer or scientist name a project. 
The most significant step to date in this increasingly sophisticated field of astronomy. The LSST program is a project that will conduct a decade-long sky digital survey of the entire southern hemisphere, which is much more comprehensive and sophisticated than any previous astronomical survey, paving the way for the future virtual astronomy of the future. The program involves the design and building of a unique 8.4 meter telescope with an integral 3200 megapixel camera that will survey the entire southern sky twice a week for 10 years with a sensitivity and resolution never before achieved in five wavelengths and with, the, for, with for the first time the added dimension of time. It also includes the development of a sophisticated system for the handling, analyzing, storage, and efficient retrieval of the massive amount of data to be generated. <coughs> the cost for this program <coughs> are projected to be just over $1 billion and are primarily provided by the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy with notable private cons contributors. These costs are not only for the construction of the instruments, but also for the creation of the sophisticated data handling network and the operations of the whole system for 10 years. The observatory is being constructed near La Serena in central Chile in the dry, clear Andes at an altitude of 8,750 feet, where the top of the El Cerro Tachon mountain has been leveled off. The LSST was proposed in 2001, and the construction of its unusual 8.4 primary mirror was begun with private funds at the University of Arizona's Keras Mirror Lab in 2007. It then became the top-ranked ground-based astronomy project in the 2010 National Science Foundation's Astrophysics Decano Survey, and the project began officially on August 1st, 2014, see the yellow arrow here. With funding from the National Science Foundation and is scheduled to begin full science operations in late 2022, see the red arrow. The uh, first light star there is in 2020, just a year and a half from now. The LSST is directed at providing new insight to the dynamic universe in four specific areas of astronomy. First, since the current cosmological models maintain that the universe is made up of 68% dark energy, 27% dark matter, and about which we know very little, and only 5% of the normal visible matter in the universe. The LSST will probe the nature of dark matter and dark energy by mapping and measuring several billion galaxies through time and space, and studying their influence on the distortion of space-time. By refining and using microgravitational lensing and redshift measurement techniques, and obtaining statistically large samples, the dynamic behavior of dark energy and the influence of dark matter on the development of cosmic structures will be pursued. The $168 million, by the way, investment of the Department of Energy, which was to build the LSST camera, is largely prompted by this goal, studying dark energy and dark matter, in the continuing quest for a unified theory of everything. LSST's unprecedented power of discovery will be a giant leap forward in the solar system studies. It will measure the dynamic property of several million moving objects, 10 to 100 times more than now known, out to the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud, including the orbital, color, and variability information. Among the objects to be detected are the near-Earth objects, with its superior imaging enabling it to find asteroids as small as 140 meters in diameter and as far away as the main belt asteroids. Depending on the, show, uh, depending on the chosen 
survey strategy, LSST, could detect up to 90% of these potentially hazardous asteroids to meet the 2005 congressional mandate, which was to find 90% of the hazardous NEOs. With these much more detailed measurements of the current state of small bodies in our solar system, we can gain new insight into how planets form and how our solar system evolved over its history. The LSST will revolutionize time domain astrophysics, or the study of how astro astronomical objects vary with time. By imaging the entire night repeatedly to great depth and with excellent image quality, it will review new information about the known kinds of variable stars and cosmic explosions, or supernova, such as. As well as discover entirely new classes of transient events. Within a minute of each significant transient event detection, LSST will generate an alert to the worldwide astronomy community to allow them to respond and catch these events before they fade forever. Finally, LSST's huge and accurate collection of data will enable us to answer some fundamental questions about our home galaxy, the Milky Way. Over the course of the 10-year survey period, it will make hundreds of observations of each surveyed area of sky. A single visit to the entire survey area will map more than 10 times the volume of past surveys. When stitched together in time, this set of observations will yield the motions of millions of Milky Way stars. When stacked in depth, this set of observations will yield a map of over a thousand times the volume of past surveys, cataloging the colors and brightnesses of billions of new stars. So, how can we achieve these ambitious goals? With a magnificent instrument system and an organized strategy for using it. The instrument system involved is a unique and sophisticated telescope with a powerful integral camera along with a supporting facility or observatory to house, service, maintain, and operate it in a semi-autonomous mode for its 10-year program life. The optical system of this <coughs> telescope is a three-mirror, wide-angle, quote, Paul Baker, end of quote, design as modified by Roger Angel at the University of Arizona, which incorporates the primary and tertiary mirror services into one of the University of Arizona's rotary cast 8.4 meter lightweight honeycomb mirrors. I described those uh, in the last couple of presentations, some of you may remember. The secondary mirror is a large convex mirror. <coughs> The telescope incorporates a digital camera with its three lenses into the overall optical design. This design yields a very wide three and a half degree field of view in an optically fast, or F.1.2, and structurally compact design with a physical length of only 6.4 meters from its secondary and tertiary mirror. The optical elements in this unusual astrograph configuration are quite distinctive. The primary mirror, M1, is, is 8.36 meters in diameter that integrates a, a separate 5.12 <coughs> meter central segment which constitutes the tertiary mirror. That's this interior section. <coughs> the, uh, and, and it yields a unobstructed primary equivalent of 6.67 meters. The secondary mirror is a convex mirror, 3.4 meters in diameter, the largest convex mirror ever made. The primary lens, or L1 for the camera, right here, or right here, is 1.55 meters in diameter, the largest lens ever made, and more than 150 percent one and a half size times the size of the 40-inch Yerkes refractors objective, which has historically been astronomy's largest lens. 
The LSST camera is, oddly enough, being built by the particle physics folks at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. It is the size and weight of a small car in position in the middle of the telescope. With a 3200 megapixel detector, it is, quote, the most powerful camera ever built, end of quote yielding an ultra-high definition images that are equivalent to 1500 HD TV screens with a very fast readout time of only two seconds. The detector array is built from 189 16 megapixel CCDs with a diameter of about 25 inches and will cover a field of view of three and a half degrees or about seven times that of the moon with a pixel size of 0.2 arc seconds. It will operate at a temperature of 100 degrees below, uh, 100 degrees below centigrade, or 158 Fahrenheit, to optimize performance. It has a built-in set of six filters, ranging from the near ultraviolet to the near infrared, with a filter changing mechanism for fast changes. The field of view contrast with an ordinary 8 meter class telescope is shown in this uh, part of portion here. You can see the difference between the field of view of, a, of the Gemini <coughs> 8 meter telescope and the LSST. <coughs> the short length, 8.4 meters, optical system of the LSST is a significant in the compact structural design of the telescope which is important to a mission needing mechanical agility. The 350-ton structure of the telescope is supported by an Altaz mount, which can reposition the telescope every 39 seconds, a thousand times a night, and then accurately track it for the pairs of 15-second exposures, and do this routine reliably for 10 years. By the way, for any of you telescope, telescope design experts out there, it has a tendu of 319 meter squared degrees, degree squares versus four for a, a large telescope, another large telescope. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Jim, one question. Um, does any light actually hit the center of the tertiary of the Earth? Sorry? Does any light actually hit the center of the tertiary mirror? Or is the tertiary mirror oh, yes, also Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay, I'm just looking at the light path in that diagram, and I'm trying to understand how oh, okay. the previous well, I, slide. I've got another, okay. I've got another slide uh, later on that I'll, I'll get to, and we'll go back to that. Good point, but yeah, it has a, it has a, uh, it'll be receiving light from, uh, I forget what I said back here, let's, uh, back here uh, to equivalent to a 6.67 meter mirror and maybe you can catch it in, in this thing you see the lights lights coming in from here going up to the convex mirror here being spread out excuse me being reflected down to the tertiary and then up to the to the camera the camera system but then there's a hole in the tertiary mirror at the center point uh, there is, but I think it must be irrelevant. Okay. Good point. <laughs> you can't put an IP there. Okay. Darn. <laughs> Jim, one question. Okay, where were we here now? Oh, yeah, Eitan group. Oh, some of you who were at the discussion group a couple months ago remember our discussion of that. All of this hardware is housed in a facility carefully designed to facilitate the highly automated operation of the telescope, as well as its maintenance and servicing. The site is located on a tract of land owned by the American Universities for Research and Astronomy, or ARA, that also includes the Gemini South and SOAR observatories, with which the LSST will share utilities and support staffing. The observing program will average 825 pairs of photos per night. One visit is equal to two photos. They take two photos for each of these views to exclude cosmic ray effects. Or two and a half million visits in the 10-year program. The program content consists of 90% for the baseline region, that's the blue area here. 
in which that visit uh, region will be visited twice a week. The remaining 10% of the program will be allocated to special interest applications such as the large and small Magellanic clouds. The control program will be a highly automated and managed by a software program which in turn provides the outputs to control, telescope, and camera, and also provides the detailed documentation surrounding each photo. This electronic manager, named the OPSIM, includes a detailed model of the telescope and inputs for sky conditions and other parameters surrounding the specific data on a file or photo. I wasn't able to capture it in the video on this, but it was really fascinating. It showed how this, this uh, OPSIM programmer will, will, will move, move the camera from location to location uh, in an automated manner. And it's a, kind of a fascinating process. This observing program will expand our identification of celestial objects to over 18 billion objects in the first year, and by a factor of more than a thousand over previous surveys, like 2030. It will increase the number of known type 1a supernova, which are the standard candle of the universe, from about a thousand now to over 1.5 million. It will catalog 5 million new asteroids and will expand by 10 to 100 times the number of small solar system bodies than those presently known. The survey will, for the first time, provide a meaningful basis for dark matter, dark energy studies using weak gravitational lensing astronomy. All of these and more are the expected results from this 10-year survey by an instrument that will obtain 5 million photos to a magnitude of 27 and a resolution of 0.7 arc seconds. If these are the expected results, what then will the unexpected results be? And how will all this be done? With data. Massive amounts of data to be obtained transported, stored, analyzed, and disseminated to scientists <coughs> around the world. With a significant consideration to us, citizen scientists, for our education and participation. On a daily, or perhaps nightly basis, some 20 terabytes of data, roughly equivalent to the contents of the National Library of Congress, will be transported through high capacity fiber optic lines from Chile to the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois in Champ Champaign, Illinois. Over the 10 year life of the program, this will result in a total of 60 petabytes of data. Every image will be examined as received and compared to previous images of the same segment of sky for changes. When a transient event happens, such as a supernova, is noticed, a worldwide alert will be issued within an astounding 60 seconds. Daily reports will be issued, and a comprehensive annual report will be issued each year to detail the accumulating progress of the survey with time. To quote the LSST website, to the user, the LSST is a database, not a telescope. This database will be mined over and over by many users for various projects. The education and public outreach programs, oops, I skipped one here, I think. The education and public outreach programs for the LSST are as ambit ambitious as the telescope itself. A planning committee has been operational since the program began to gather inputs from the public in designing a program that is intended to provide non-specialists access to LSST data through tools and interfaces that engage various communities and groups with authentic astronomical research opportunities. To provide a link with the public, a specifically designed, user-friendly online internet portal, 
and several other interfaces will enable users to view the sky to access the photos and participate in various educational and participatory activities. Customers for these services and activities will be the general public, formal educators, citizen science investigators, and content developers for science education facilities. This education and public outreach program will enable amateur researchers to initiate projects such as Galaxy Zoo using LSST data through collaborations with Zooniverse and other online resources. The LSST education and outreach program anticipates that the number of citizen science projects in the astronomy field will dramatically increase when the LSST is operational giving a whole new generation of citizen scientists the opportunity to deepen their engagement with astronomy <coughs> using real data from the LSST. I suggest, why not astronomy clubs? Why not the Warren Astronomical Society? So to summarize, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope Project will have a major impact on astronomy for the next decade and is unique in many ways. It will involve scientists, engineers, IT folk, educators, and citizens from many disciplines to educate and exploit this program. It will have a thousand-fold increase in capabilities and will gather more data than all the previous astronomical surveys. It will detect 20 billion galaxies, or more than 100 times those now known. Each photo image will encompass, and encompass 40 times the area of the moon with a 15 second, second exposure that has more acuity and sensitivity than ever before. It will visit each point in the sky more than 800 times over 10 years and create the greatest astronomy movie ever made. It will create new methodologies for examining dark matter and dark energy. And after tonight, it will have a song dedicated to it. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, it's about time. Huh? And finally, if you'd like to get even more involved with this fascinating oh, program, gosh. they are looking for a few good women and men with various skill sets to join them at locations throughout the U.S., Chile, and other lo locations. You can help them define the future of astronomy and answer some of the mysteries of our universe. Check it out on lsst.org. I'd also have to add that lsst.org, their website is a wonderful website with all kinds of information. Also, I have a number of, a limited number of information cards up here on the counter. Just pick one up if you're interested. And finally, to close my presentation, Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. I'd like to pay tribute to a project that a decade from now we may look back upon with awe. I'm sure that Johann Strauss would not be offended at my borrowing his melody to honor this endeavor. <laughs> SST is on its way to study the stars and the Milky Way and happenings in the universe, like cosmic explosions and outbursts, looking for asteroids and things, and my intercept dark planets rings, it's past white and deep. I repeat, LST will show you. It will show many things we've not seen before. Some will alarm us, may even harm us. In the span of years, we'll see change appear. I will tell the truth as the scientists. It's fast and wide and deep, and it's data 
by the feet Cosmic answers we shall bring Cause the LLST will change the strategy CCD and some of the photo uh, the but astro how did they make the camera that cold? With uh, they have I don't know it's a major design thing I know that you can go to the lssd.org site and there's a whole section on the design of the cooler for that. Yeah. Anybody? Liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen. Is that how they do it on an ongoing basis? Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. There you go. Anyone else? This, this I, I, I put on, I made a couple of extra slides, but this one is one of the more impressive ones to me. Is, is yeah. How they did, this is the first mirror of its type yeah. to ever be built. So it looks like maybe the hole in the center is just to reduce weight on the mirror? No. I, you know, I don't know, it maybe has, might have something to do with the process of that rotor of kiln because all the other mirrors had holes in them. Right. That's a good, that's, yeah, a that's the building project. That's the University of Arizona. Uh, their, uh, their facility makes these mirrors, and they're very interesting how they put them together. They balance them, uh, whereas the middle of the mirror will have this holding though because it's part of the rotation pattern. Yeah. And then they're even. And then they do these other mirrors where they tilt them slightly so that the the, the mirror is kind of wide at the edge and kind of narrow at the edge. Right. right. It's in, it, yeah, we, we explained that process before, but having said that, that hole in the center is not how they make all those mirrors because they're making the mirrors now, they're in the fourth or fifth of the large Magellanic uh, telescopes. You know, it's going to have the six mirrors, and none of those have the center section has a hole in it, but the rest of them don't. That, that's a good question. Yeah. Without an answer. So. <laughs> Gary. All right. Now, Simple pleasures for simple lad describes oh, me. 
but unless the stars we observe are too bright for this, this will drive variable star observers like me into extinction. And I've always wondered, I knew that was going to come. I knew it had to come sometime in this century. And I guess this is the technology that will do it. To repeat, unless our stars are too bright for this, but we are, our days are numbered. Thank you, right there. Yeah. Like, like that one quote, that the LSST to astronomers around the world will be a database that they will be mining. It's not going to be a telescope per se. But this, I, I thought this is another slide. You remember our discussion here a few weeks back? I've not gotten any more insight than that, but I thought it was impressive this is their definition of what Econ do is. And you'll see up here, this LSST optical design says the total light throughput for Econ do is 319 uh, meters squared, degrees squared, versus a four meter, normal four meter telescope, which is four, 319 versus four, and it's got to do with the efficiency, the ability of light to register on, uh, on photographic uh, detectors. Yes, sir. Jim, do you know where they're going to store the data? Is it going to be in Maryland, like Kaplan? Champaign, Illinois. Illinois, okay. Thank you. University of Illinois. Apparently, that's where the supercomputing center for the country is. I didn't know that. Okay, okay. We have the answer for that. Um, the hole in the middle is 1.8 millimeter diameter hole in the secondary mirror. Holds the camera body? No, not in this case. The camera body is located in the center of the telescope for center of gravity purposes because this telescope has to move every 30 seconds to a new location. This is what the report says. Is that right? I don't know. The primary shows the optics up near the top there. All that. That is the optics. There's a regular uh, Newton type, Newtonian type telescope put it on the camera right at the back. Right. But this one doesn't. The camera, specifically, because it's so heavy and it's so large, is mounted right in the center of the telescope structure. Uh, there's a slide back here that showed that, I believe. It's, it's, it's the top of the phone. Yeah. 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 Anyone else? Well, I really thank you. Appreciate your attention. SSP. And I would hope that once this thing gets operational and this outreach program uh, gels a little bit, there will be opportunities for astronomy clubs to participate in projects that will be meaningful. Thank you. Thank you.